You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. He's back and he's at the bar, and I'm super excited that Dave has returned down to the 9-foot homemade oak bar. What's up, Chris? Here in my basement. He is wearing a mask, though. He, 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 but you know what? It's because you're a responsible person. I am a You're like, yes. I got a tickle in my throat. I'm not sure I'm going to put one on I got for a your little, safety. I got a little tickle in my throat. I got a little thing in my you know chest. I've been dealing with it all summer. It seems to be an allergy thing. That's what everybody kind of says. But, you know, better safe than sorry. Care about you guys, so you know if if it you know if for whatever reason it's not that I don't want to be you know infecting you guys. I because, love you for that because I I am a responsible person and I <laughs> do care I do care about my fellow Illinoisans uh, and I'm going to I'm going to do you know I'm going to do the responsible thing. You're a good dude, and of course, Saxon in the Basement is proudly brought to you by Family Waterproofing Solutions, Dave. Covering most of Northern Illinois and Northwest Indiana. Great Sacks in the Basement deals, veteran owned, female owned, family owned, and big supporters of Sacks in the Basement. Call them today at 708 330 4466 or visit FAMWS.com. I want to start off the show right now making a statement because I feel like everybody in the world's making a statement. Oh and I want to qualify any remarks we make on this show today. Andy Mazur's on the show today, new radio voice of the Chicago White Sox. We're going to talk about what's going on with Michael Kopech. I have some opinions on that. We're going to talk about how people in this specter of COVID-19 are reacting to the fact that Major League Baseball is even going to play here coming up in the next week and a half. All of this we're going to talk about. So let me just make this very frank because I've have, I have discussed this with my kids. We sit down, we've had a conversation. What's safe? What isn't safe? Look, there's an awful lot of science out there. There's an awful lot of data. I had a, a, a statistics professor in college who said, I can basically use statistics any way I want to to prove my argument. There's the, you, can, you can move numbers however you want to in statistics. True. Okay. The point that I, I want to make here is that there are some people that are only consuming their news from one source. There are some people that are spending way too much time getting their news off of social media and having knee-jerk reactions to the thing. Uh, when you read something, I would hope that you take out your own little calculator and figure out the numbers. I would hope that you look at the CDC site, the WHO site, and figure things out. I hope that you would do what my friend Dave did right here, understanding the mask is more for my protection than his protection. And he put one on today while he was down here in the basement because he wasn't feeling 100%. And I would hope you would do what I did this past weekend when I was at a party over at your place, an yes. outdoor barbecue, yes. where I told my parents, I won't see you for the next two weeks. And we're going to be careful who we're going to be around for the next two weeks because we exposed ourselves, even though we were in a safer setting being outside. That uh, I want you to understand that I see this as a real disease that is more contagious than the flu. That is something that needs to be taken seriously, but also it, it relies on personal responsibility. And I see it as a disease that that really exposes who are the selfish people in this world who don't care about other people and who are the people that care about others. And I care about other people just like you do. And that's why you, my friend, came down here and put a mask on. Correct. And I want people to understand that before I get into what my topic is. And here. please, please understand, Chris and whoever else might be listening out there. Um, I am not wearing this mask. I am not, underline the word, not wearing this mask to make a political statement. No. That is not the idea here. Okay. That is not Politics what any, should never have been involved in that any is of not this. what any that is not what anybody you know who wears a mask is doing. They're wearing a mask because they are concerned for themselves. They're concerned for their uh, their fellow man, their friends and family. So you know this is not a polit you know me wearing this mask right now is not a political thing. We're going to get in the Michael Kopech thing before the show is over. Yes, we're going to talk to Andy Mazer before that. But before I dive into any of it. This is the point I wanted to make right at the top of this show. I am disheartened, upset, annoyed, ticked off, and tired of mainstream media, podcasters, bloggers, Twitter users, and Facebook users in the White Sox universe, in and around it, that seem to be rooting for this to go wrong, that seem to want almost for a tragedy to happen 
so they can say, I told you so. Yes. It seemed to be rooting against this season happening. I would like to take this from the perspective of hope. I believe that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I am not sitting around saying that the world sucks and it's only going to get worse. I want to have a little faith in human beings. I want to have a little faith in the process that Major League Baseball has set up, even though there have been some bumps in the road. I am totally excited to see the smiles on the faces of the ball players out at the ballpark and practicing with each other. And I want to believe that they're going to be responsible adults. And I am sick of people trying to treat it like they're just a bunch of idiot ball players who are too dumb to protect themselves. And we need to be making the decision for them about whether or not they're playing a season. And we're rooting against it happening. I had an actual listener send me a comment. I don't understand why we're playing. Just wait until a ball player dies. And then this will all be shut down and everybody's going to feel stupid. And the way I read it was, I like that person couldn't wait to send me, you see, I told you so. And I hate that attitude. I hate the constant people who are just regurgitating stats about coronavirus where they're just, they see a tweet that follows their mindset and they just retweet the thing and they can't wait to put the stuff out there. I'm sick of the negativity. It's a real thing. I get it. But can we talk baseball and can we enjoy the fact the Sox are back on the field and stop being so damn negative about this entire thing and waiting for it to fail? Because you shouldn't be rooting for this to fail. Because if it fails, it means people got really sick and people died. I'm not rooting for it to fail. I want it to succeed because I want to have hope. And I'm bothered by the negativity, Dave. Right. Now, the reason you're getting, you, you realize the reason you're getting that is because, and we had mentioned this about five minutes ago, uh, and that's why I brought up what I brought up about, you know, I'm not wearing this mask as a political uh, statement. People have planted their flags, Chris. They have planted their flags on their side of the line, whatever line it is you stand on. And they want so desperately to prove that their side was right. So that they can say, see, I planted my flag in the right place. I have not seen any of this where people are, are people are wanting it to fail, but oh, I've seen I've it. I've seen a lot of other uh, negativity and and doomsday sayers outside of baseball that are basically doing the same thing, and it comes to a point where it's like, look, you know, at what point do we put that aside? I don't at think what, we can. at what point do we say, look, you know, this is a thing we're all in it together. Well, I think that the, I think there's a middle of the road that feels that way. I think you and I feel that way. I would imagine the majority of the people listening to the show feel that way. I certainly hope so. But there's no way that we can control the 20% on one end of the spectrum and the 20% on the other end of the spectrum that hate each other so much they can't stop fighting. And they're the ones that drive the conversation these days. Yes. And and they the problem they are they are they're the they're the what what is it you call they are the vocal minority. And but the thing is they're very negative and they hate each other. And they want and 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 their negativity now it's 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 unsettling those of us that are I think very intelligent middle of the road thinkers that understand there's good and there's bad there's ups and there's downs there's things that the president has done wrong and there are a couple of things that he might have gotten right there's things that the democratic side has done wrong and there's a couple of things they might have gotten right because you know what how is anybody going to be 100 percent right or 100 percent wrong with something we had never seen before in this world You're not. okay and, but 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 right now me making that statement. 20% of those that are listening to the show are angry right now because I said there's possibility that the president did something right, even though I said he did things wrong. And there are 20% right now that are angry that I said there's a possibility that some Democrats did something wrong, even though I said they did some things right. Yes. There are people who just focused on that because they planted their flag and they're angry. And those are the people that scare me the most in this entire thing. And those are the people that I, I just hate listening to at this point because I want to have hope. I want to have hope for my kids. I want to have hope for my family. I want to have hope for my friends. The fact you showed up here wearing a mask today gives me hope in humanity, but I knew that about you already. That's why we've been friends for 40 years, what kind of person you are. Well, and I you. love the fact that the two of us sit around and we had an honest conversation as you walked in the door. I said, you want me to put one on? He goes, no, I'm not worried about you. I'm trying to protect you. You go ahead and you talk because you're not feeling you're not feeling bad. And we're still sitting at a distance on either end of a nine foot bar right now. Yeah. And we, we are being as responsible as we possibly can be. And I have faith in humanity because I know enough people that are good human beings. I want to talk to a person that seems like a very good human being from what I've learned about him and who I've heard 
good things about. I know people in the industry who have told me great things about him. I've never talked to him before, but Andy Mazur joins us next right here on Socks in the Basement, the brand new voice of the Chicago White Sox. I got a real treat today on the show. Joining me on the line right now, Andy Mazur, the brand new voice, play-by-play guy of the Chicago White Sox. And it's nice to meet you, sir. How are you? Chris, don't call me sir. It's Andy, and I'm uh, happy to be with you. I appreciate it. I Listen, <laughs> I, you've had you've had one heck of a 2020. I mean, everybody's had a weird 2020, but yours has got to feel like a roller coaster. First off, you know, the unfortunate passing of, of Ed Farmer, and we've met Ed on this show and, and, and spoken with him, and he was a great guy and enjoyed talking with him, a real sincere person. And, you know, that's that's a heartbreaking thing, I think, for any White Sox fan. And you, as, as a broadcaster, now get this incredible opportunity where they go, you know, Andy, we'd like you to be the new play-by-play guy. That's like my dream job. I, I mean, I'm going to tell you that right now. I'm never going to be able to accomplish it. I went to, to broadcast radio, but I always thought that was just the coolest thing in the world to be able to call play-by-play for the White Sox. And you get this amazing thing, and you're probably like, okay, well, we're going to be starting this off. It's going to be a new season. And then, and then a pandemic hits, and then you're not even sure if you're going to get to do it the first year that you're going to be the play-by-play guy. And now you get this shortened season. I mean, describe the ups and downs of this for me, because I would imagine <laughs> it's been even it's been more unique for you than I think most people. Yeah, it definitely has. I mean, it's a, it's a bittersweet journey because, you know, obviously with that not being around and it's such a shame too, because, you know, I got to know him pretty well over the, the couple of years that we were together uh, in the broadcast booth. And one of the most genuine human beings that you'll, you'll ever come across is, as you probably could gather from your conversations with him. I mean, what you, what you hear is what you get Uh South side guy through and through and big white Sox fan, obviously uh, playing for the team and, being able to broadcast uh, for them for such a long period of time. So that part of it, you know, is, is a little uh, on the sad part because, you know, walking through that booth for the first time is going to be really strange uh, without seeing Ed around or hearing Ed's voice uh, coming into that booth. So that part of it really uh, sad, you know, and the other part was just kind of a, a whirlwind because you know, as you point out, I was at spring training when they got shut down and came back, uh, came back to Chicago and kind of wrote it out and didn't really know what to expect with the, uh, with the virus and uh, you know, the way that things were going with uh, the two sides negotiating, who knew if we were going to get a season going period end of story. Uh, and then to find out that we did and then to get uh, officially named was, uh, was really a thrill for me because anytime you can broadcast a, a baseball club in your hometown, uh, you're winning as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, you don't have to move, you know, everything, uh, uh, around you have uh, family and you have friends and plus you know the the relationship i've developed with the white sox now over the last couple of years uh, i cherish i mean it's been a it's been a great opportunity for me and a great uh, a great learning experience and uh, i've i've met some terrific people including darren jackson who i can't wait to get going with yeah that's that's the one thing i was curious about with you because you know look you're going into a unique situation that i've experienced myself Years ago, when I was bouncing around the country doing radio, I got hired on to be the morning host and basically run a show where, like, I'm the lead voice, just like a play-by-play guy would be. But they wanted me to to come in, and I had a an already co-host, like that extra person you're bouncing off of, that they wanted to keep. And I remember that being the most difficult thing for me because you weren't starting on the same ground. Like they had they had been there, they were established in that in that studio and on that station, and you were like the voice that was coming in. And I know you did some filling and stuff like that, but I, how do you feel about that? You're going to get in there. You're going to have to kind of work out a whole new relationship with, with Darren and, and kind of, you know, I know at some point you get, you hope to get to the point where you can read each other's mind while you're doing a broadcast and you get into that flow. But I mean, how, how do you, I mean, you guys talk a lot on the phone or are you trying to like, just kind of just get, make that relationship stronger and stronger as you lead into this? Like how, how does that feel going into that? Well, it feels great because, you know, the, the games that we did have a chance to work. I mean, we were, we were able to, to kind of go into it uh, pretty seamlessly uh, you know, I met him a couple of years ago. So I mean, when we first took over the broadcast at uh, at WGN, I, I make it a point always to, I, I like to learn about the game. I love the game. I'm a, I'm a student of the game. And I I love talking to the guys that played it. So Darren and I would talk a lot. We, we would talk on the field. We would talk in the booth. Uh, we had some friends in common from his days in San Diego and my days in San Diego. And uh, he was uh, a second round pick of the Cubs and uh, then went to, 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 the, uh, to the Padres. We know a lot of people. Uh, in common. So we've, we've had conversations even prior to me doing some fill-in work. So that, that kind of laid the groundwork for it. 
And, you know, we'd, we'd ask each other questions about, uh, you know, how to handle certain situations, uh, some strategy stuff from my from my end, talking to him about it. And then he would ask me some interesting questions about, uh, you know, how I deal with players and how I get players to uh, trust me and, and uh, you know, have that good working relationship with. So, you know, DJ and I, had, we had a pretty good, uh, pretty good working knowledge of each other even before the first time I filled in. So it was, it was kind of easy because uh, he's such a good guy and such an easygoing guy that, you know, he was kind of willing to feel things out from, from my perspective, since I was the guy that was basically leading it, I guess, at that point, for lack of a better word, even though I realized at that point it was more his broadcast than it was mine because uh, he was doing it full time and I was only filling in, but you know, he, he's very respectful. He is, uh, he knows that I work hard and that I've worked hard to get to where I, where I am again. And I think he respects that. And I completely respect uh, his knowledge of the game. And he's a great guy. I mean, I, I consider him a really good friend. And uh, we've talked uh, several times here during the off season and uh, both of us can't wait to get going. That's awesome. Now you're talking about talking to players and there's something right now going around the team. So I, I, I kind of want to ask about it. And it's kind of a weird subject, like the whole Michael Kopech thing where he decides he wants to opt out in 2020. And it's a, it's, it's basically a delicate subject in taboo because you don't want to criticize, you you know, if the guy wants to opt out, it's a, it's his personal decision. If he doesn't feel comfortable and if he's nervous about the virus, but then you're also kind of getting this, this insinuation that he was also worried about in the shortened season. There's an article out in the athletic about the idea that he wasn't sure if it would be in his best interest coming off of Tommy John to play this abbreviated season and and if he would be able to ramp up. Do you think there's any way that this blows up a little bit where some teammate gets annoyed with Michael or uh, is upset that he's not there when they're there? Or do you think that the team is in unison here right now supporting uh, this young player? You know, you said it uh, before. It's a personal choice. And, you know, the, the negotiations that went on between the two sides gave him the right to opt out. So, I mean, it's it's not a situation where he went out of his way to do it. It was something that was there for him to do if he wanted to, and he chose to he chose to exercise that right. Now, listen, he's he's paying a price for it because he was not considered a high risk individual. So, those that are not considered high risk individuals don't get paid and they don't accrue service time. So, that's one more year basically that the White Sox have his rights, and uh, one year later for him to go to free agency now because he's not accruing the time. So, you know, at the end of the day, you kind of have to look at it this way. You have to kind of say, everybody is dealing with this in a different way. And if he's that fearful of the thing, you have to take him at his word and you have to believe him because there's no way that I could ever tell you that I know what Michael Kopech is going through or that I know what David Price is going through or that I know what Ian Desmond's going through. Uh, Guys that have already opted out like him and Mike Lee too. I mean, there are some guys that are doing it for health reasons because they are a high risk person or they have someone in their immediate family or they just had kids or, or whatever that they're trying to make sure that they're taking care of their own, which is what you're supposed to do. I mean, you know, they, they play baseball as a vocation. Yeah. But uh, they come home to their family and they have to really worry about that as well. So it's, it's hard for me to sit here and tell you that, you know, I know that he could play if he wanted to, or, that he's not he's wrong about uh, being worried about not being able to ramp up in time uh, with a, with a shortened season. Look, I mean, it's his choice at the end of the day. Now though, the organization has to look at it from the standpoint of okay, well, who's going to fill that role? And the last couple of days, they've seen some candidates emerge that maybe wouldn't have emerged if this didn't happen. So you, know, you have to look at Jimmy Lampert. You have to look at uh, guys like Dane Dunning who are getting an opportunity now that uh, they may not have gotten if Michael Kopech would have played. So it's, it's a catch 22, you know, because the guy wants to play obviously, but something is preventing him from doing it this year. The organization has got to go on. So you're going to have to figure this thing out uh, as, as we move forward here, even to next year. You know, you mentioned two names that I was going to bring up next, and we've actually had Jimmy on the show before when he was uh, down in double a, and he seems like a great guy. We've had a long conversation with him. We haven't talked with uh, Dane Dunning yet, but th- those are two guys that immediately jump to the forefront as guys now to have an excellent opportunity of making it on this staff, and they're capable pitchers. Talk a little bit about these two guys and, and, and what they're showing right now. Yeah, so I, I never have really had an opportunity to chat with Lampert. I, I've had a, a good opportunity to chat with Dunning, so I guess I'll come at it from that perspective. You know, Dane is a, uh, he, he's a, he's a warrior, he's a competitor, and a pretty cerebral, smart kid. 
Uh, it's taken him a little longer to uh, to refine it after the after the Tommy John surgery. He lost basically two seasons because of it because the diagnosis came late in one year and then he lost the rest of the next year. And now he's trying to work his way back. And you know he's he's definitely a guy that uh, that could be in the mix as far as what they decide to do with their bullpen or what they do to their starting rotation. Are they going to go five man rotation? Are they going to go six man rotation? That's something that Ricky Renteria and Rick Hahn will have to, de- to, to devise as they pick their 30 guys to, to, uh, to start the season on July 24th. Sunday, he pitched in the, uh, the inter-squad game and three scoreless innings. So you, you can't ask for more. And he was facing the team that featured many of the guys that there are presumed to be in the White Sox starting lineup once things get going for real. So, so that's a good showing for him. And the day before that, Lambert did the same thing. I mean, he was mowing guys down and – He's like about a year. He's about a year outside of his Tommy John surgery. So, you know, you get that 12 to 18 month thing where they they talk about some guys heal quicker, some guys take a little longer. So that's kind of the, the you know you look in the dictionary and their pictures are there. The 12 month is Lampard, the 18 month is uh, and longer is uh, is Dunning. But there's some great arms in this organization still that a lot of people don't talk too much about. Jonathan Stever is another guy that's uh, in the in the minors that is an Indiana kid that uh, went to Indiana university that uh, could be counted on as well. And the other thing, and I hate that, I don't know if I'm stealing any of your thunder here, but uh, with the season starting in July, like it is, there are guys that are healthy now that wouldn't have been healthy in April. And one of them, I gave up the home run to Luis Robert the other day. And that's uh, Carlos Rodon who looked pretty good as well. So <laughs> he gave up the one where Robert fell over, right? Well, yeah, you hear the story because Robert <laughs> was fooled on the pitch and swung so hard that he made connect he made contact and then his back foot gave out at him. And he hit the deck, and he was kind of watching the ball go out of the ballpark from the from the dirt. Um, and I know Rodon was impressed. I mean, he was re- really impressed with the with the with the kid. But you know, Rodon is another one of those guys who said, said um, if he didn't have bad luck, he didn't have no luck at all uh, with the injuries. So so hopefully he's he's back and shaking through all that and uh, can make a contribution because it, it looks like he could be one of those guys. You know, Rodon had the best reaction to it too. He tossed his glove like, "What? Come on! How yeah. did he hit that thing out?" That was it was beautiful. Yes, it was. Andy, I want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. I got hooked up from a mutual friend uh, that wanted to plug uh, Kevin Clancy, who's uh, some big time high school basketball coach. Uh, probably would have won a state championship if it weren't wouldn't have been for the pandemic for Notre Dame high school. And uh, I'm sure is sitting there on pins and needles, hoping that he gets to play a season this year because he's got a pretty good team. Yeah, I like the fact that you made him wait till the very end also to give I him did. the plug. So he has to actually, he actually had to listen to me talk and, and you talk, you know, from the very beginning of this interview to the very end. Uh, you know, Clance, uh, I, I congratulate him. He did a nice job with uh, with his team this year, too. And I, I felt kind of bad because they, they had a chance, I thought, to uh, to make some noise in the state tournament. Uh, I've known uh, I've known Kevin for a while, uh, called some games of his at uh, Loyola, and uh, he was one of those guys that would rather uh, pass than shoot. But, hey, you need those guys on your team, don't you? You do. You need that guy. You need a Kevin Clancy on your team somewhere. Uh, Andy Mazer, uh, so nice of you to stop by. Uh, if you need somebody to stand in the background while you guys are in the booth and make crowd noises, you just <laughs> let me know because it's going to feel really empty in there while while they're, while you guys are playing those games. Or here's my suggestion. Just put MLB The Show 20 on, take off the announcers, and just play it through the loudspeaker. It just sounds like crowd noise the entire time. Worked great for me. So if you need, But if you need crowd yeah. noise, I'm your guy. All right. Well, we'll uh, we'll keep your number in the in the in the phone here and the speed dial. And if we need you, we'll, we'll call you. Thanks a lot, Andy. We'll talk soon. All right, Chris. Take care. Are you or someone you know looking to learn how to play a musical instrument this year? Then you should be checking out Westgate Music School, 6527 West 127th Street in Palos Heights. Private music lessons for all instruments, including guitar, piano, drums, voice, bass guitar, violin, banjo, ukulele, and more. Are you a vocalist? Are you ready to play a musical instrument and looking to join a group? Westgate Music School offers group classes for rock band, acapella vocal, and barbershop quartet. Students of all ages and ability levels will have the opportunity to perform three times a year in a student concert. Gift certificates for Westgate are also available. More information, call 708-586-7002 or go to westgatemusicschool.com. So we heard from Andy Mazur. We asked a bunch of questions. And and one of the things that I brought up, Dave, with him, as you heard, is I brought up the delicate situation of talking about Michael Kopech. 
I'm really baffled and bewildered by this Kopech situation. I right am now. too. It's 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 a really strange. It's a strange decision. Yeah. And I want to get into why I think it's a strange decision by him. I'm not going to sit there and say it's a bad decision. I'm not going to judge Michael Kopech as a human being. And if he's truly fearful of COVID-19, then how, who am I to pick on him for it? Because like I said earlier in the show, none of us know the truth. The science changes on a weekly basis sometimes. We learn different things, good and bad. We see death rates drop, but we see that you could possibly get it uh, a little bit easier when you're inside. There's all kinds of, we, we learn more about more about it each week. And, and if he has a fear that I'm not, like, like Andy said in the interview, it's hard to judge that. But Dave... Let's let's just talk baseball and baseball decisions. From a bus- baseball business perspective, this is a very odd decision that Kopech has made. Right, because James Feagan comes out in The Athletic and writes a very good article the other day, which outlines the fact the White Sox had talks with Kopech over a period of weeks, long conversations between him and Han and him and Renteria and the organization talking with him and his people. And what's amazing is it's not just a COVID-19 concern. He expresses a concern that he won't be able to ramp up well enough coming out of Tommy John in this quick summer camp setting and a 60 game schedule to be effective. And so he doesn't feel it's a good thing for him coming out of the surgery. Now, by saying something like that, and if that's the conversation that happened, and if that's the narrative that's out there, well, yeah, I'm concerned about COVID-19, but Major League Baseball has deemed me as not being a person that's at risk which means I'm not getting service time. He would have gotten a year of service time for 2020 and I'm not getting paid. What also happens now is that next year after, and Andy mentioned it during the interview, Jimmy Lambert and Dane Dunning have an opportunity to shine this pitching staff, which we will have plenty of starters going into next year. If Michael Kopech and his camp assume that he has a starting job and the starting five going into 2021, after sitting out of live baseball for two years, I think they have another thing coming no, and because the White Sox will be fully justified, Dave, fully justified if they sat there and said, well, you said that you need extra time to ramp up and you haven't seen live pitching. So we're going to start you in AAA next year. And what if they keep him down for 50 days? Right. That means he's going to lose another year another of service year. time because he, a guy with one year that he earned while he was on the DL because he was on the major league roster when he got injured and 41 days of service time in 2018, if held out for about 50 days, will end 2021 with less than two full years of service time and will be not one year away from free agency, which everybody keeps reporting that he is, but two, but two more years away from free agency for this decision. And that's the thing that boggles my mind. Now, I just thought of this as you were describing the situation. If you are, you know, if you are Michael Kopech, now there there may be this in play too. If you are Michael Kopech, you might say, okay, yes, I'm worried about COVID. Yes, I'm worried about my ability to ramp up um, for such a short in such a short period of time after being gone for such a long period of time. Maybe he's saying, "Look, I am confident in my abilities as an athlete that when we flip the calendar to 2021, I will be able to hit the ground running and kick ass and earn a a spot on this rotation based off my abilities." Now, if you Look at what we know about Kopech. You know, Kopech, he seems to me like a pretty well put together dude. He seems to me like somebody who would have that confidence, that swagger, that faith in his own ability to be able to say to him. Don Cooper says he deals with anxiety and depression, which the White Sox are not very happy that he no, said. No, they aren't. And but you I can mean, read that I, between the lines. They're very upset that he said that. Okay. And I don't want to judge the kid. But saying, I mean, like, but what, what the, you're saying he's got swagger, and I've, I've seen him before. I've seen him face to face. I met him wait, once. He seems him. like he's a really confident kid. I used to call him Nuke Lelouch, right. you know, because of that. So, I mean, maybe that's what his thought is. I, I mean, I don't know. We don't know what he's thinking. I'm just speculating. But, y- you know, that could play into it. Do you besmirch the White Sox, though, as a fan? Do you even think it no. holds water if somebody complains about them holding him back no. for 50 days to no. start 2021? Because I almost expect it now. If they get if they get the production that they expect they're going to get out of a Carlos Rodon, because he looks good right now, okay? And he comes out in his final year in his contract year, he's got a rotation spot. Lucas Giolito's got a rotation spot. Dallas Keuchel still has a rotation spot, all right? Dylan Cease is going to have another, uh, another season with the team, albeit short. Reynaldo Lopez, another season with the team, albeit short, okay? I, you, you have guys in Jimmy Lambert, 
you have guys in Dane Dunning right. that are going to have an opportunity. Trust me. Look, prospects are prospects. How many times do we talk about this on this show? Prospects are prospects. There's no guarantee if a guy's going to work out no matter where he's at. He's still going to be officially a prospect. He's still going to be officially a prospect because of the amount of innings that he's actually pitched. That's correct. Most people are going to rank him as a prospect in 2021. These other guys have an opportunity. I don't care where you were drafted at and who you were traded for. If those guys are performing and, and the White Sox are able to sit there and say, well, look, we've got an awful lot of good guys. And Michael has indicated before publicly and his camp has indicated that he needs a lot of time to ramp up coming out of this. And he hasn't thrown a pitch in live games against people in games that matter in two years. He's starting to AAA. How does any, I mean, you're going to get people who are going to say, oh, that's unfair that they did it to the kid. There might even be the narrative spun. He did it for his own personal health, but his own camp has said now that it wasn't just about COVID. So I, it's going to be a very interesting thing to see if anybody tries to say, oh, the Sox are wrong for holding him down. I almost fully expect him to hold him down now. Listen, listen, uh, you know, I have taken a lot of heat on this show for being very negative about things that the White Sox do and how they conduct their business. You know, and we've said it before, I, th this summer, I applaud the White Sox for how they're handling these things. I applauded the White Sox in the offseason for doing what they needed to do to get the players in here to win, okay? And I applaud them in the way that they're conducting their business now, in, in all ways. When it comes to players testing positive for COVID, when it comes to uh, the way that they're handling the COPEX situation, the way that they're handling the COVID situation, the, the COVID-19 situation in general. I mean, I, I have to say, like, I applaud for the job that they've done. They have done a, I think they've done a very, very good job and have carried themselves very, very well. I know it kind of bothers me because I, I always felt like one of the best parts of the show is that we used to pick on them. And now I have nothing to pick on right now. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm just super excited. Like I have nothing to pick on. I have not. I'm sure I'll find something to be annoyed about with them right now. But there's really no, nothing for not, me to scream and yell about no, with you the don't. White Sox. I right mean, now. there's always going to be annoyances when you're following a sports team as close as we do. Well, like why the heck are they doing this or why the heck are they doing that? But you don't have. We've not. We've not aired any major grievances. Yeah, I think it's coming now. I think it's coming now. I think Danny Mendick should be starting at second base. I'm going to beat that drum like crazy. I think that he should get an opportunity to start at second, unless your intention is to break camp with Nick Madrigal. I don't like Larry Garcia at second. I hate the idea of Yerman Mercedes playing third. I'm so sick of these people who are like, we're going to take this guy who's not a very good defensive catcher and now make him a third baseman. Like they're trying him out. I've seen people that are that are clamoring to make him the third baseman if Mancada isn't ready. But when he comes back, I, I hate that idea as well. Look, you you got a Garcia. You've got a Mendick. Uh, the, play, you need to play defense, okay? Stop looking at these sabermetric things and say, well, I just love this guy because he hits a big, deep, long ball, okay? I, I want I want the team to be able to hang in the games. And, I, and in a shortened season, if your Mercedes cost you a game or two with his glove in the first week, right. that could really pay. That could really hurt you a lot more if he did it in a 162-game season. So there are going to be things for us to yell about. But right now... Not bad, man. No. Not bad at all. No, not at all. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found. And always on SocksInTheBasement.com.